For 21 years, I lived my life on my little island of Sri Lanka, never leaving its shores. Eventually, when I did, as a young law student and journalist, it was not a matter of choice or design so much as it was out of fear and compulsion. My country back then had transformed from an idyllic paradise to a country that was devastated by a civil war, that thousands were being killed. It wasn't a hospitable place for students or journalists or lawyers, or indeed for anyone. And shortly after I left, my dear friend, my mentor, and my journalistic partner, who had in fact convinced me to leave the country for my own safety, was himself kidnapped and tortured and killed because of his convictions and the work he did to fight injustice. Now, since then, I have lived in more than 20 countries around the world. I have traveled to more than 100. I have had the opportunity to be touched by the lives of thousands of people and the rare privilege to hear firsthand the stories of men, women, and children who have survived Ebola in Africa, who have survived tsunamis and cyclones in Asia, who have survived conflict and wars in Europe, who have survived violence and discrimination in the Americas. They have all shaped my life and changed my world. None of this, of course, was part of my life plan, but I am here to bear testimony to the fact that change is not only possible, but it is ine inevitable. Just 200 years ago, there were about a billion people who lived on this planet. Today, there are 7.5 billion. By 2056, there will be 10 billion. Just in the last 25 years, the world has lost forests the size of South Africa, 126 million hectares. Just in the last 50 years, we have seen two-thirds of the world's wildlife population disappear forever. In the meantime, global warming increases, sea levels rise, storms occur. Just in 2015, there were 7,000 natural disasters around the world. Sheets of ice are melting in the Arctic, in the Antarctic. If we don't stop it now, it will be reversible, no matter what we do eventually. In the meantime, there are 28 ongoing armed conflicts and wars that have already killed thousands, displaced millions. In fact, just last year, the world saw the highest number of people who were forcibly displaced ever. 65.3 million. Imagine that. That's almost seven times the population of the entire Belarus. So what does this all tell us? It tells us that change is happening and it is happening now. We can either grab it and control our destiny, or we can be changed into oblivion. Change is survival. It is no longer possible for us to have a party today and hope and expect somebody else is going to clean up tomorrow. There will be no tomorrow. But you might say to me, I live in Belarus. It's peaceful. There haven't been any major epidemics or natural disasters in the recent past. There are some economic challenges, but it's a safe country. And my family and I live with a degree of comfort. So what's the problem? Why change? This is not my problem. This is not my challenge. This is not my cause. I was talking to some young children, and uh, I asked them, what do we have in common? Your kids, 
I'm an adult. You're Europeans. I'm Asian. You're white. I'm brown. We don't even speak the same language. One little boy raised his hand and said, but we are all humans. And then another little girl, she must have been, I don't know, nine, ten years old. And she says, but we share a common home called planet Earth. What those kids were trying to tell me, and tell us all, I think, is that in an ever-shrinking world, global challenges and local problems are indistinguishable. When an iceberg melts in the Arctic, an island will disappear in the Maldives. When a bat infects a man in Liberia, Ebola will surely emerge in Amsterdam. When the stock exchange crashes in New York, people become poor in China. When bombs explode in Ukraine, refugees need shelter in Belarus. Our future, our destiny is intertwined. Conventional borders and fences and walls no longer offer us the protection that it used to. I was recently in Beijing and of course the greatest wall of them around the world is right there in, in China. But does it really offer any protection anymore to the Chinese? It's a beautiful piece of architecture. Is it going to stop a virus? Whether it's coming through a computer or some other way? So we can make a choice. We can scan the horizon and look for opportunities together. Or we can circle the wagons and believe that we are somehow safe. And believe that somehow the future will never arrive. Well, that's a futile hope, isn't it? Because it will come. And when it does, we would have missed the opportunity to have learned from people who dealt with the same issues that we now have to deal with. Recognizing that our destiny is intertwined, the world's leaders came together in 2015 at the United Nations and made a promise to each other and to all of us that by 2030, we are going to live in the world that we want to live in. It's called the Sustainable Development Goals, and there are 17 of them. We said that we will, by 2030, live in a world without poverty, without hunger, without unemployment, that we will live in a world that has better health care, has better education, less inequality, that we will live in a world where there is peace, there's justice, People live in a safe environment. People respect the environment. That the current generation will fulfill its needs in a way that does not compromise the possibility for future generations to meet their needs. Now you may say, wow, that's a tall order, isn't it? Really? We're going to be able to do that by 2030? But let's not forget, in the year 2000, the world came together as well and said, we're going to achieve eight goals, not 17, eight. And they were called the Millennium Development Goals. There were a lot of skeptics who said, hmm, it's never happened before. How is it possible? Well, by 2015, we not only achieved most of them, but in many cases, we surpassed them. Belarus is a good example. In the year 2000, Belarus had more than 40% of its population living in absolute poverty. The global goal, the Millennium Development Goal, was to halve poverty by 2015. And Belarus managed to bring absolute poverty from more than 40% to less than 6% in just 15 years. So I say to the skeptics, it is possible. It is possible, it's hard work. But it also means that we all have to work hard together. The promise of technology and the vision of a common humanity which these global goals provide us give us the opportunity to change the world into what we want it to be. I believe that we may well be, in fact I think we are, the first generation to have the power to eradicate 
poverty. And I believe we may well be the last generation to have the opportunity to save our planet. But if we are to do that, we have to look at the world differently. If we are to do that, we have to look at each other differently. And if we are to do that, we have to help people to look at themselves differently. If we look at the world differently, we will begin to understand that our actions have an impact beyond our households, beyond our communities, possibly even beyond our lifetime. If you choose to make a positive impact, it can be small actions. Turn off a light, ride a bicycle, eat responsibly, lead a healthy lifestyle. If we choose to look at others differently, it means that we will fight those stereotypes that we have learned about other people from a distance. Travel to another land, learn another language, sit with your neighbor's autistic son or the pensioner down the road, walk in somebody else's shoes for a while. If we help other people to see themselves differently, we will unleash the potential of a significant percentage of humanity that lives in the same home as we do our planet and will help us all to not just survive, but prosper. There are one billion people around the world out of seven and a half who live with some form of disability. In Belarus, there are more than half a million people who live with different types of disabilities. Ask yourself, when you go out on the streets in Minsk, how often do you see a man in a wheelchair, a woman with a white cane, a child with Down's syndrome? Not very often, right? But half a million out of a population of 9.4. So where are they? Imagine a world where we together have eliminated the barriers and the obstacles, psychological, emotional, financial, physical. Isn't it better than making these people objects of our sympathy? Some people might say, ah, oh, that's such a lot of resource we need to invest. I would flip the argument on its head and say that is in fact the most important resource that we have. The diversity of our humanity is in fact the one resource that can actually save our people and our planet. It's not technology alone, it's people. It's people like you, it's people like me, and it's people we unfortunately don't often see because we have not eliminated the barriers together. To leave no one behind in our common pursuit is not only the right way, it is the only way. But to do that, we need to know who are these vulnerable people and where are they? And let's remember, today you may not consider yourself a vulnerable person, but tomorrow you may well be because suddenly you're poor, suddenly you have a disability, suddenly you're not well. We need to understand that different people are faced with different challenges at different times. To treat everyone the same, in fact, is to perpetuate the discrimination. If you treat a person who is unequally situated in an equal way, you're actually continuing the discrimination. At the same time, it's really important that we don't only focus on the needs of people who are disadvantaged or marginalized or vulnerable, because that means that they are passive recipients and other people give. What we must do is focus on their potential. What is it that we can do together not just to bring down the barriers, but to unleash the potential that they have to contribute to this common pursuit. And thirdly, we need to fight the stigma, the discrimination that keeps people, including ourselves, in prisons. It's not only the people who are objects of stigma 
and discrimination who are imprisoned. We are too by our own stigma and our own perceptions of reality, which are often the result of a lack of knowledge and fear. Don't forget, it wasn't so long ago when many thought that women should stay barefoot pregnant in the kitchen. It wasn't so long ago when many thought that people with HIV and TB should be ostracized from society. It wasn't so long ago when many thought that children with mental illness should be shut away forever. It wasn't so long ago when many thought that people of color were from an inferior race and were only good for manual labor. Ask yourself the question, does a woman, a child, a refugee, a person in a wheelchair, a grandmother from a little village that was affected by Chernobyl, do they deserve less? Would they be able to give less if they had the f resources that we have at our fingertips? Let's not forget that Steve Jobs' father was a Syrian refugee. Let's not forget that one of the most brilliant minds in the world today, Steve Hawkins, is paralyzed and trapped in a body that doesn't function. Let us not forget that Joan of Arc and Marie Curie, despite the contributions that they made to the world, they ha paid a heavy price for being women. The world is changing and we have a choice. We can choose to bury our heads in the sand like an ostrich and hope that tomorrow never comes. We will end up on the wrong side of history like dinosaurs. Or we can choose to dismantle those barriers that prevent us from reaching out, from understanding our fellow human beings. We can choose to work together to save this planet for us, for our children, and the children of our children. Because I believe that together, we can move mountains, we can save planets. Thank you.